الحمد للہ وحد وسلاۃ وسلام علامن نبی بعد اما بعد الحمد للہ نحمد ہو و نستعین ہو و نستغ فر ہو و نمن بہی و نتوکل علیہ و نعوذ باللہ من شرور انفسنا و من سیئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا صدق الله العظيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وارحم على عبدك ورسولك سيدنا محمد النبي الامي وعلى اله وسلم تسليما There are many different aspects to the life of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam And no doubt for a program like this on tazkiyah and on some spirituality for those who are seeking the path of the pleasure to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's one role of the many many roles and that is the role of the beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam as a murshid as a guide as a muzakki as a trainer and purifier of the spiritual hearts of the companions but really as a trainer and spiritual purifier and guide for the entire ummah and that is why it's very important that when we think about the concept of dhikr we have to join the concept of dhikr with the concept of the sunna method and teaching but the sunna philosophy behind and you know undergirding that dhikr and you know this topic came to me because as all of you know this is the month of rabil awwal and there are you know different ulama who take different positions but there are some ulama who are conducting programs on siratun nabi or sometimes they call it mahfil dhikr habib the gatherings to remember the beloved uh, messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and i'm sure the station may be doing some programming uh, related to this but what came into my mind uh, just when i saw these words of dhikr and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and because i have been getting you know i ask this question frequently uh, about what dhikr should we do and because last week also we talked about this issue that a person should make dhikr at the outset as well and i'll just review that the most important thing is that we obey allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we stay from it, away from disobedience that we should be regular in our established worship that we should develop and try to have honor and dignity and virtue in our character and our behavior and then yes there will be a state where a person may be able to have dhikr of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which increases their qurb and their intimate nearness to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but at the same time i mentioned that at the outset and throughout the journey of struggling to obedience struggling to obey struggling to stay away from disobedience trying to be regular in established worship trying to work on our behavior and character that we have to begin with the dhikr of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a reminder to ourselves to remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remain conscious of him to remain ever seeking his pleasure and one of the greatest ways we do that is by following the sunnah of sayyidina rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so my answer to this question what dhikr should i do is what i want to talk about today and the first answer to that question is the first form of dhikr is the sunnah itself so i'm going to talk about sunnah duas and sunnah adhkar sunnah sentences and formulas of remembrance later what i'm mentioning here is the first aspect of dhikr or just to simply express it in english the first way the fundamental way the foundation that will lay the basis for our ability to exist in the state of remembrance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to what extent are we established on the sunnah and by the sunnah i'm not just talking about a uh, very important thing such as sleeping on your right side i'm talking about the sunnah lifestyle the sunnah outlook on life the sunnah perspective on life the sunnah balance between ibadah and family the sunnah balance between ibadah and dawa the sunnah temperament the sunnah you know this is what i mean by the sunnah because what i've observed in people and in myself at different stages of my own life 
uh, and all of us, we are still works in progress, is that the more that a person is calibrated on the sunnah, the easier it is for them to do dhikr, the easier it is for them to be regular in that dhikr, and the more they actually benefit from that dhikr. And when a person's lifestyle, their temperament, their perspective on life, their attitude is far removed from the sunnah, even if they try to make the dhikr, at most they will outwardly be performing a ritualized form of dhikr. That dhikr does not affect their heart, transform their behavior, uplift their spirituality. Except obviously what Allah Ta'ala may choose and does choose to gift and grace anyone from His infinite rahmah, His mercy, His karam and fazl, His grace and generosity. So the first thing is to adopt a lifestyle of sunnah that requires being simplifying our relationship with the dunya, being a bit detached in our relationship with dunya. This is known as zuhud, having a sense of balance and giving time to family and work along with our deen. Within deen, having a sense of balance and spending time on ilm, but acquiring knowledge, but also in worship and remembrance, but also in calling and inviting others to deen, also in serving the community and serving the humanity in ilm and dhikr and dawah and khidmah. And it's when a person, and, and the way to acquire this is to study more the seerah and the biography and life and teachings of the beloved Messenger Wasallam. The way to understand this more is to read hadith, especially from like Riyadh al-Salihin, to read the Shama'il. So I mean these three things, let's say any book, a solid book on seerah, a work on Shama'il and uh, a hadith collection such as Riyadh al-Salihin. And then to look at our own lives and not just do this for some type of historical or theological understanding of who the Prophet was and what his life was like, but to look at our own lives and try our best to align that life and lifestyle and perspective in line with the Sunnah. Now when we do that, then the second thing, the second thing is, yes, there are different acts of worship, acts of remembrance, ibadat and adhkar that if we do even a small amount on a regular basis and the ideal of regular is twice a day if not twice a day then once a day if not once a day then once every other day could even be uh, a basic level of regularity but if you do it more infrequently than that it's hard to call that regular and so depending on a person's schedule uh, their himma, their spiritual strength, their resolve, and ultimately depending on the tawfiq, uh, the, the success that Allah SWT bestows upon a person, that will determine how regular or not a person may be. Now before I talk about the sunnah adhkar, I want to mention that there are some additional exercises adhkar, sometimes in Arabic they were called awrad or azghal, that mashaykh and awliya Allah used to prescribe. If we look at it historically, the overwhelming majority of the time that such things were prescribed were for a limited period of time and also for an intensive period of time. And, and the best example of this was known as the chilla, the khalwa, uh, when a person would spend a few days, a few months, sometimes 40 days, sometimes 40 month, four months, but other, you know, other durations as well, intensely devoting themselves to worship. The closest thing that most ordinary believers may come to that now is if they go on a visit to Haramein Sharifain for Umrah or if they try to do more ibadah in Ramadan or if they sit in some form of itikaf or full sunnah itikaf in the last 10 days of Ramadan or they spend, you know, one, two, three days at some spiritual retreat or weekend retreat. And there's a notion that if you if you can try to free yourself up, but not your whole life, because there's no monasticism in Islam, but free yourself up for certain amounts of time where you dedicate yourself fully to worship, this is also very beneficial. And this should be done periodically, not regularly, you know, every week you take off three days, but periodically, it depends on the person, you know, twice a year is good. Uh, maybe more than twice a year, depending on a person has an opportunity, maybe less. All right, so that is one aspect. And the benefit of those extra awrad al-nashgal really is when done for short, limited times and for an intensive, uh, you know, in an intensive way. That said, there's a way that they can be maintained and continued uh, in a sort of, in a very 
you know, in a very, you know, in a few minutes a day, and I'll explain that later. Um, but the point is that all of these methods are not the maksud, they're not the goal and object themselves. The goal and object is to have presence of the heart, to have a state of heart which was known as halur, that your heart is present, is always aware of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is focused on the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is in a state of awe and reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is always remembering the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is done first and foremost by being aligned with the sunnah of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, now... I will just mention a list of things, uh, and, but then I, what I really want to do tonight is to try to share a way of understanding what our approach should be in terms of our own daily regimen of dhikr. So the list of things is number one, tilawati Qur'an, daily recitation of Qur'an al kareem The second is sending salawat and salam on Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, salutations and blessings. The third is seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, istighfar. The fourth is, is making a dhikr known as tasbih, a dhikr in which a person proclaims the glory and pure, pristine nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and magnifies Him in this way. Hamd uh, is a way to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Uh, another dhikr is to, mention, is to make dhikr of la ilaha illallah. Another dhikr is to make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's essential name ism zat ism mufrid ism jalala allah and to repeat the zikr of that name with the tongue and in the heart another zikr is to make duas calling upon allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using ismail husna another form of zikr is to make the sunnah duas that the prophet offered another form of extra ibadah is to pray some nafil salah whether that is awabin or tahajjud or ishraq whether that is salatul hajjah salatul tawbah salatul istikhara etc Another form of extra worship is to fast some additional fasts. So this is basically the list, and I may have missed one or two things, but this is the list. Now, what I suggest to people, uh, obviously the person who's hearing these type of things for the very first time, and up to now maybe it's only been doing from the ibadat, what are known as the faraid and wajibat, the mandatory worship, uh, then they need to start with a very small amount and a very simple explanation. But today I'm actually going to address people who have been seekers of this path of extra worship, have in their life done some sunnah, nafil itikaf, have gone for some nafil umrah, or any of these things, have re recited Quran, have made extra dua, have tried to pray some extra prayers, kept extra fast, have tried to do different sunnah itikaf, different regimens of dhikr, Right? And sometimes a person needs some structure and guidance in how to do that. So I'm going to provide a limited structure and guidance now, but I also want to encourage that the true seekers on this path are really going to try to put their own heart and person and personality into try to trying to develop a regimen of dhikr for themselves. So let me start with istighfar. So you, one way would be to do a little bit of elementary research and find that and you will find that there are different sentences in the Quran and different sentences in the authentic hadith which teach us how to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. Then you will find that some of them are in the form of du'as, supplications, prayers, and some of them are in the form of sort of declarative sentences. And what you need to do is understand the meaning of those different forms of seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness and then see which of those meanings resonates with your feeling at that time or which of those meanings represents a feeling that you want and you find that that feeling is absent in your heart. So to give you an, an example that I often give, that if a person, there's different ways of seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, performing this act of, offering this act of istighfar. One is if a person has sinned, maybe you just sinned immediately, or you sinned recently, or you're remembering sins in your recent past or distant past, or you're finding yourself attracted once again to sins of the past. So there's some sinful thoughts, sinful feelings, sinful actions, sinful memory, right? So for that, it may be that the feeling that you would want in your heart would be more closely aligned with 
a particular istighfar as opposed to another one. So, for example, there's a du'a mentioned in the Quran, Rabbi inni zalamtu nafsi faghfirli, that, O oh my Rabb, indeed I have committed a grave zulm, an oppression I've wronged, I've done an injustice to my own self by sinning, by disobeying you, by violating the very purpose and reason of my existence. Rabbi inni zalamtu nafsi faghfirli, and thus, therefore, I ask Allah Ta'ala that you forgive me. Right? So this might be the formula, so to speak, the sentence of seeking forgiveness that you may like to use upon and after committing a sin or on when feeling sinful attraction or when remembering one's sins. But there may be another day in your life that comes where Alhamdulillah, uh, due to the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He preserved you from sin. You didn't do sin that day. You didn't do sin in the immediate recent past of that day. Right? And you're not really right now in the feeling of remorse or regret over past sins. So, and this is actually the way, the Prophet, the Sunnah way of seeking Allah's forgiveness. In other words, when Sayyidina Rasulullah, he sallallahu alayhi wa it's narrated in authentic hadith that he made istighfar 70 times or 100 times a day. It wasn't like me and you that we sinned at night. We have some sins and we're fearing remorse and we're making toba. It was rather just a general expression of his human, of his humanity in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sometimes there may be some days where we also want to tap into that feeling. Even though we are indeed sinners, and we do still need to cry much over our past sins, sometimes we also need to tap into the feeling of, you will, if you will, of a mutlaq istighfar. And so for that, for example, a sentence that the Prophet sallallahu often used, Astaghfirullah al-azim alladhi la ilaha illa huwa al-hayl qayyum wa atubu ilayh. Alright? Uh, so this is an example to look at different type of istighfar and to see and when you can do it 100 times wonderful you can't do it 100 times 70 times you do it as much as you can whenever you can and remember again the ideal type of regularity is twice a day because this comes in Quran al-Kareem many many times pertaining to extra acts of ibadah and dhikr bukruta wa asila morning and evening morning and evening morning and evening and many of the sunnah du'as and sunnah sentences of dhikr that the Prophet ﷺ taught, he also taught them in this manner that whoever does it in the morning will be safe from this in the day, whoever does it in the evening will be safe from this at night, etc. So the theme of morning and evening reoccurs throughout the Qur'an and the hadith. But if you can't do it twice a day, once a day, once every other day, alright? Similarly, Tilawat to Qur'an should be a balance between reciting the entire Qur'an al Kareem sequentially over time, but also having some certain surahs that you may recite, such as maybe Surah Yaseen, Surah Mulk at night from the Sunnah, and also having a connection with certain ayat of Qur'an that you recite to yourself, you recite frequently, you sit and ponder upon them, huwa ma'akum, ayna ma'akuntum, Allahu alilina amanu, right? Uh, so many uh, verses to reflect upon that it's not just enough to be inspired by those verses or to be amazed at that verse when you hear it in a lecture uh, but that's the first step but now you have to walk away with that you have to keep that you have to remember that verse recite that verse keep letting it inspire you keep letting it motivate you keep your connection to those verses that inspire you during your tilawa recitation or when you're seeking knowledge during tafsir or when you attend some lecture or gathering walk away and maintain that connection with those verses so similarly the sunnah du'as of the Prophet another important thing is to go through a collection, so oftentimes we tell our friends to take the collection of Shaykh Shafali Tanvir Ta'ala, known as Munajat Makbul, and at the first time just read it and just circle the ones that immediately strike you, or you know they represent feelings you have or you wish you would have, and do those more regularly and remember those du'as, so that you can make those du'as at that time, that you can remember them by memorizing them, or at least recall their existence so that when you are in a state of heart or or you're confronted with a life situation in which that du'a would be of benefit to you you remember that that du'a exists and you open up that book and you read it and you offer that du'a uh, in a heartfelt manner to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because right now your personal condition or your life situation is mapped to that du'a right 
uh, then you know sometimes you will be short pressed for time so there are some adhkar of the Prophet some that are short and combine multiple things so for example in the morning you can recite subhanallah wa bihamdi astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh this is also a zikr that the Prophet taught and this has your tasbih and your hamd and your istighfar three things all in one short sentence and then after that you know a zikr that Shaykh Ashraf Ali Tanvi Ramadan used to teach was first to begin with la ilaha illallah and the la ilaha part is about negation right and a person is trying to negate not just that there's no god except for allah subhanahu ta'ala but right now there's nothing in my awareness except for allah subhanahu ta'ala there's no being i love in the, in the way that allah ta'ala should be loved there's no being i love in that sense there's no being i want to please in that sense so it, it there's many aspects to this negation that is being done in la ilaha so this is known as nafi. Then there's affirmation or ithbat when we recite illallah. And that's why the mashayikh used to teach that when you say the word illallah, you should feel as if you're casting Allah Ta'ala's name. This was known as dharb. And dharb did not be done out loud or by shaking your head or by making noise or jumping. It's just a concept that you're casting this these kalimat illallah into your spiritual heart, into your kalb. It's almost like you're spoon feeding your kalb. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're pumping it into your kalb. So la ilaha illallah. And the affirmation is that you're affirming Allah subhanahu ta'ala, affirming his existence, affirming his divinity, that he alone is the ilah. You're affirming his being your mahboob. You're affirming his being your ma'bud, the being of your worship, etc. La ilaha illallah. Now the very interesting thing that Shaykh Ashraf Ali Tanamata taught was after you say this, let's say you say this a hundred times, so the short version of this is to say La ilaha illallah one hundred times. And then after that, it's enough now. You've negated the world, you've negated your awareness of the world, you've negated the delusions of the world, and now you need to spend more time on affirmation, right? Because ultimately the dhikr of the it's not, dhikr is not to remember the world and negate it. Dhikr is to forget the world and remember and affirm Allah subhanahu ta'ala. So then he drops the first part, la ilaha, and says now you should just recite illallah. So it's still part of the kalimah, still part of the sunnah, but now focus on the affirmation part. And he says, you know, for example, one can do this then 200 times. And then when you've done that, now you're ready to remember Allah subhanahu ta'ala himself. So he teaches and that the third step you should make dhikr of Allah Ta'ala's name by repeating it as, as it comes in one hadith in the Sahih of Muslim, Allahu Allah. And the way the Mashaikh would teach this is that the first time you say Ism Jalala, Allah, you're again casting it, right? Uh, in your heart. And the second time you say Ism Jalala, Allah, it's as if you're expressing it from your heart. And then in the middle, because you're going to say this continuously, so the way the Arabic language is, you will vocalize it in the middle, but there will be jazm, you will uh, pause, have a glottal stop at the end. So, Allahu Allah, Allahu Allah, Allahu Allah. And then one can recite this 300 times. And then he would say that for 100 times, you recite simply Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name, Ism of Ism Allah, Allah. This is a call, this is a plea, this is a focus, this is a remembrance. And then you recite that with your tongue, you recite it with your heart, you recite it with both. And then some Mashaikh also teaches that after completing this exercise, then you just sit there and you keep remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If need be, you remember Him in tongue and heart, you keep saying Allah ta'ala's name, Allah, Allah, Allah. Or if the benefit of this zikr is that now you feel focused enough, you just remember Allah ta'ala's name with your heart, which is known as zikr kalbi. And I found, and this exercise can really just take 10 to 15 minutes. So it's an abbreviated form of a dhikr uh, using words and sentences from the sunnah. The Shaykh Ashraf Ali used to teach 100 times la ilaha illallah, 200 times illallah, 300 times Allahu Allah, and that saying it twice counts at once, so 300 times Allahu Allah, 100 times Allah, 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 and then sitting there in silent zikr of Allah Ta'ala's name, and then after that, even continuing to sit in silent contemplation just on Allah Ta'ala's being, or on any of his names, or any of his attributes, or any verse of Quran, at that point that you wish to ponder and reflect upon. And what can be very beneficial then is that after that, to recite Quran al-Kareem. 
And sometimes I try to do these three things in order. So to first recite hundred times Subhanallah wa bhamdi astaghfirullah wa tubu then to do this zikr of la ilaha illallah illallah Allah Allah and Allah and then sit silently and then recite Quran. And the benefit from this is then that what's happened due to the benefit the barakah of dhikr is now you are focused. And you're focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then when you recite Quran, you know, even for people who like us who know Arabic it's, you're still in danger that if you recite Quran, you may still recite in ghafla, in a state of heedlessness. But the benefit of the zikr is, number one, that when you recite Quran, you're focused. So you do focus on the meaning. And obviously that meaning will inspire feelings in your heart. But you're also focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are the two feelings, and I'll sort of end on this and continue this next week, inshallah, that these are the two feelings that we should have when we make the act of zikr known as tilawat to Qur'an, reciting Qur'an. There, one feeling is based on the meaning of what we're reciting, and the second feeling is based simply on the fact that we're reciting kalamullah, simply that we're reciting Allah Ta'ala's kalam to him, and that Allah Ta'ala is listening to us recite it. And that feeling is the feeling of thicker, of our awareness of Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala, our yearning for Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala, our longing for Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala, our love for Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. And sometimes doing recitation of Quran after making 10-15 minutes of dhikr as a kind of warm-up, if you will, helps that Quranic recitation have a deeper impact on us. So we make dua, inshallah, that Allah Ta'ala establish each and every one of us on a sunnah lifestyle, on a sunnah temperament, and may give us the strength and resolve to do extra acts of worship as a means of obedience and drawing closer to Him. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbin alameen.